sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. I suppose my musical experience started when I, I, I was playing the flute um, in an orchestra in Liverpool. And my my mum used to go to orchestra. She played violin. And it was kind of when, when it started, um, you know, it was pretty much just like a, a kid's club where mum would get to go to the orchestra, give her a bit of a breather from us kids. And me and my sister would go into this training orchestra and just like, blow the flute or she played the, the C clarinet um, and you know we'd just be in there making a load of racket um, but I remember pretty early on just loving that feeling of like learning to make a sound with something and surprising yourself that you were able to achieve that and then from then on kind of never looked back really it was just I loved playing in the orchestra making music with other people um, and then gradually I just gravitated towards like drums, guitar, you know, piano and other instruments um, and and ukulele, banjo, you know, like anything I could get my hands on. I just love that feeling of like just making something that wasn't there before. I think that was always the thing for me, that that sense of wonder in that moment. Um, and um, and yeah, just sort of each, everything just sort of fell into place after that, really. Wow. Yeah. So do, do you still play all of these different instruments? Yeah, I mean, some better than others. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, that, that was, that's never been the point for, um, you know, I, I guess I've never been great at sort of one instrument in particular. It's always been like, it's more of a means to an end to be able to record something or make a song or, you know, if I hear an idea and go, oh, that could be cool with some, you know, a ukulele line or mandolin line, then, you know, I just get a mandolin and, start messing around with it and figure it out and learn a few chords. And then before you know it, it's like, okay, great. You use it in a different way. Whereas I think, you know, if you're very technically proficient at an instrument that leads you in a certain direction, whereas it's always more about like the sound of things for me. Um, but you know, I did, yeah, I still, I would say regularly I play piano, acoustic, um, and electric guitar and, um, drums, you know, they're the three main kind of ones I just always go back to. And I use guitar and um, piano to write more than drums. Yeah, that, I mean, that that makes sense. And, and it's more, I guess it's more freeing to, you know, use instruments for a purpose, like writing a song or putting a part down than it is to try and get as good as possible. I know that sounds... For people who don't play music, maybe that sounds a bit basic, but it's like, it, you know, if you set yourself the challenge of getting as good as possible at an instrument, then there's no end. Whereas if you set yourself uh, the challenge of putting a part down um, or writing a song, then at least you've got something to work towards. When when did you start playing? Um, well, first of all, actually, because you, cause you played first in an orchestra, um, you must have been, were you reading music then? Yes. Yeah. So I learned to read music um, for the flute and, and piano lessons as well. Um, and then obviously, like, I got to a point where um, I was about to do grade seven on the flute when I was like 13 or 14. And I'm just kind of, I'd started already getting really into, you know, guitar and piano. Um, and I'd just got my first drum kit. And that whole, my love for music was definitely more Nirvana and, Green Day and stuff like that, rather than, uh, you know, classical music. I mean, I still love classical music, but 
you know, at that in, when you were a teenager, it was more about the angst and the energy and stuff. So I sort of, again, because the the sounds that I could make on a guitar or on the drums were much more like the things I was listening to and loving. Um, it felt really natural for me to just pour all my energy into that. Um, and kind of links into what you were saying before, to be honest, that when doing the flute, I would go to lessons and, you know, it was very much about learning a piece of music and playing it as well as possible and, you know, making sure there were no mistakes and it was all like as perfect as, as you could make it. Um, and I was definitely not naturally great at that side of things. You know, I could do it, and, but I had to, my mum and dad were constantly like, come on, you need to go and practice your flute. And I'd be like, oh, you know, I'd much rather like sit there with an acoustic kind of figuring out the latest Oasis song or Blur or, you know, or whatever was on. That's what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. So, and it felt more exciting, even though it was less like, you know, it wasn't as technically good as what I could do on the flute, but it felt so much more exciting because it was like new and unknown. Um, so, and I think as a musician, it's, you've got to try and keep that sense of wonder. Um, but again, all musicians are different. You know, some musicians love like nailing down their instruments and their part to like a really high standard. And that is what they love. And that's what they buzz off. Um, I, I'm somewhere in the middle, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, and I guess wanting to do something, whether it is, you know, one side of things or the other, uh, if, if, if you actually want to do something, you know, that, that makes all the difference. And it sounds, yeah. like, you, you know, you've always had this like huge passion for music. So when did you start to play gigs and, and start to think, you know, that you might want to do music professionally? Um, <clears throat> I, well, the first gig I ever did, um, was the battle of the bands at school in Liverpool. Um, and I'd sang in the, the choir at a school play of, um, Joseph and his technical, a dream coat, I think it was, or was it, um, Bugsy Malone? I can't remember. I think, no, I think it was the Joseph one. And, um, one of the guys in the choir, played acoustic and he was like the first, you know, the first one who was like into a bit of rock stuff as well, similar to me. I didn't know him really. And he was just showing me a few chords and then turned out that another guy played guitar. And before we knew it, we were like, oh, we should put a band together for this battle of the bands. And I was like, well, I've always wanted to play drums and I do play drums a bit sometimes. Um, at, by that point, so I'd started playing some drums and percussion in the orchestra because I just loved, um, I loved, you know, drums and the whole that whole rhythm side of things um so I was like yeah cool I'll pester my parents and that's how I ended up getting a drum kit because of the battle of the bands um so it was something to aim for and then we just learned a few covers and made one original song I think um and yeah and played the battle of the bands and it was like the best moment ever up to that point <laughs> and I was hooked yeah that that live uh buzz uh, that must, yeah, that must be still such a an incredible memory because there's nothing like the first time that you do something like that uh, mm. and all the prep that, that would have gone into it. When when did you uh, meet the rest of the people in the Wombats? Um, from what I know, it was kind of at uni, right, or at, at the Institute for Performing Arts. Yeah, so at Lipper, um, myself and Murph did this like HND in sound technology and um, and you know, song pop music and songwriting and stuff. And we got on really well. And, you know, we just went out and we were getting like smashed and we started playing some silly songs together. And um, I mean, we were just hung over most of the time, but music was our way through the hangovers. And we'd just like, you know, get a couple of acoustics and start messing around with stuff. And then we started doing like acoustic nights and um, open mic things. Um, kind of as an excuse just to go out and have a few drinks, you know, and, but then kind of made some songs that, um, and we were like, oh, this feels really good. Like, should, why don't we start a band? Um, and then Murph carried on at Lipper. Um, I left and went and did French, Spanish and pop and music as well um, at Liverpool Uni. And then basically it was like, right, if try and find another musician, either a bass player or a drummer, and I'll do whichever one, you know, the other one that we don't find. Um, and anyway, 
he ended up meeting Todd um, and he called me the day after and he was like, oh, there's this Norwegian guy who's really up for playing bass. Um, so I was like, oh, cool, I'll be on drums then. And there was actually this American guy who played guitar for the first like six months of the band, but then he oh. um, he left. Um, well, we, yeah, he, he went away for the summer back to America and we replaced his parts with backing vocals. And then that kind of changed the whole sound of the band. And then from then on, we were like, oh, yeah, this is this feels even like even more exciting. And we made a few more songs that summer. And yeah, when when he came back <laughs> to, you know, to start uni for the next year, we were like, ah, sorry, mate. <laughs> God, he's, a, he's the Pete Best of the uh, of the one. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, I but he's, he's an absolute lovely guy. And he's been a, he's been to see our shows in like San Fran and a few places. And oh, yeah, okay. it just, you know, there's no hard feelings like it was it was it was kind of it it made sense yeah yeah well definitely uh made sense uh in hind hindsight that's for sure with all that you have achieved uh, so basically from from what i know as well uh because it's all different now because we can access anything uh online uh but before you released you know a guide to love loss and desperation which which you know i still remember in 2007 how that was on the radio all the time uh and the people just loved it it was just such a huge album but you actually released another album a year before but only in japan is is that true <laughs> yeah um so we um we, we got together in 2003 towards the end of 2003 and like um <clears throat> Back then, obviously, that you know, there was no. It was just us burning off demos and like studying and playing gigs on the weekends, and um, and then we started doing more and more gigs, and it kind of just started snowballing. But then, you know, labels would maybe come and see us play if we did a gig in London or whatever, and then all of a sudden we got this message through on MySpace saying uh, from Vinyl Junkie, this Japanese label, like, hey, we love your, you know, your music. Um, do you want to make an album? We'll give you a thousand dollars, and we were like, "Woohoo! Why not?" You know, if we, and we thought like, if we get a chance to go and play in Japan, that'd be so cool. And we had no other offers, nothing, you know. And also, we didn't. You never know what's around the corner, and we had no idea what like making it meant. So we just sort of jumped at the chance and made an album on our own. And you know, we learned so much whilst we were recording it. We recorded it in our manager's like basement, um, at this office he was in, and like we produced it ourselves and like got it mixed by some friends who were studying at Lipper and sent it over to them. And that was it, you know, and the people who did the artwork for that were also friends. And then very soon after that, I think because we'd released the album in Japan, it added another layer of like, well, hang on a minute. Who's, who's this band from Liverpool who've, you know, first unsigned band to play in China and have released an album in Japan, like what's going on. And it piqued everyone's interest, I think um, in the music world. And so, you know, we started getting some more people to gigs and then like grew a bit of a, the fan base grew even more. And then by that point, labels in the UK started sniffing around and um, yeah, but we definitely consider Love, Lost and Desperation like as our first, you know, it's our first album, really. The other, the one before was like, it was almost like a, a, like a run through, you know, I mean, I suppose it was an album, but like it for for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like it was like just us it was like an extension of the demos we did before. Yeah. You know, we must have put out like, I don't know, seven, six or seven, like three or four song EPs like before that. And it was just all part of like the learning experience and, you know, growing as a band um, and finding our sound as well. You know, it takes time to find the sound for some bands. And for us, it took a few years to kind of figure out who we were. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was a, it was a really good experience. The, the, some of the, same songs huge songs uh you know the, uh, the the you know girls boys and marsupials has uh moving to new york is that the first track of the album yeah it's like all these songs that go on to become massive hits are actually out already a year before uh your you know proper like first album is released so it kind of shows you that you can be extremely talented um, but you need to like graft and you can have the songs already there, but you need yeah, to yeah. graft in the way that you guys did and get, you know, uh, people around you to help push that, uh, music out. 
So oh, yeah, because we, we literally like we I mean, we always believed in ourselves. We were, you know, we were dead excited about the music we were making and we loved it. And we kind of couldn't quite understand why things weren't happening because we were like, but us and like our family and our friends and people who come to the gigs, you know, we had like a little fan base going and there was loads of excitement there. And like people were buzzing off those songs that, you know, ended up becoming like way more popular, but no labels would take a chance, partly maybe because the name, the Wombats and also, they just maybe didn't quite get what we were. We, we didn't fit in a genre particularly um, that they could just, I don't know. It was weird. Um, you know, we did have some meetings and like some record label people would be like, oh, yeah, really like the stuff. But maybe, yeah, change your name. Like, and, um, you know, and whatever, you know, they'd say some things and we were like, oh, you're just not, you're not really, you know, it doesn't resonate with us what you're saying. Like, see you later. And <laughs> inevitably, you'd never hear back from them and, I mean, moving to New York, we'd been playing probably for coming up to two years before we released it. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and it is mad when you think. And it also, I feel like stories like that should give confidence to musicians out there who maybe feel like, you know, because in this world, especially nowadays, we're all so used to, like, getting entertainment, like, at the drop of a, you know, click of a button and um, everything, like, now and that that sort of, like, you know, frenzied kind of like consumer event cons cons consumption of entertainment it's kind of like you listen to a song and then you don't listen to the album you listen to another song and you know it's a bit like Arr! and you can definitely i would imagine you know people can get disheartened by not having that sudden like why am i getting a big tiktok hit and i've played this song and it's so good and my mum and dad love it and you know but <laughs> we just we just kept like grinding it out and playing gig after gig, you know, we had this sort of, fortunately all three of us had this stubborn belief that what we were doing, other people, you know, it would resonate with more people at some point. Um, unfortunately it did, you know, and you, pff, yeah. yeah. Eventually other people believed in us as well, as much as we did. It, it definitely did. Uh, what was the turning point that led to you kind of being signed and did you re-record all the songs when you went to Rockfield to, to make that uh, first album? Yeah, we did. Um, there were, we, we, cause since we'd released the like Girls, Boys and Marsupials, we'd, we'd written a bunch of new songs um, and we kind of had this like, this set of songs that we'd, we'd play at our headline gigs, um, which was basically the album and you know, over the year, the, the last year, I guess, it, we just sort of honed it. And, like, there was never a doubt, basically, about which 13 songs were going to be on the album. It was like, there it is. And we wanted to record it all in one go, um, you know, and make an album from start to finish. Because before that, we'd all, you know, it had been a little bit pieced together from different sessions here and there at different times. And for us, it was, like, so exciting to be like, yes, you know, we get to go and make, like, a body of work in one three-week um recording session so we had a couple of arguments with the label because they were like oh we love the demo or you know the previous version of this song for example um it's got something special that they loved about it and we were like no we've <laughs> we did end up flying a few bits around but um yeah in in general yeah it was all all freshly done did did you know uh once you'd finished that album that you know what was about to happen did you think okay we're really close here or did you have mm. no idea? No idea. Like, I mean, it was, as I say, we always kind of, we believed in what we were doing and we were just hoping that, you know, we'd find more fans out there and connect with people. And, you know, for us, we just said to our manager, like, we just want to play as many gigs as possible. You know, it was like one long party for us and we just kept doing gigs and gigs and gigs. And we were so busy all the time that there was no real time to think, you know, to step back from the picture and go like, what could happen or what is happening or anything. It was just like, well, we're just going to keep going. You know, nothing really changed in our little bubble. We just recorded the music and cracked on. Um, it was more like outside of our bubble where everything was happening. And I remember the first time we noticed something was happening was, um, I think it was V Festival that summer after we'd recorded the album and we'd released Kill the Director already. And when we played at that festival, like it was in this tent with a couple of thousand people. It was like the biggest gig we'd ever done really. Um, and I remember we played a bunch of songs and, you know, there were a few people who knew a couple of them, but in general, it was definitely like, this is a new band that people hadn't heard. But then when we played Kill the Director, the whole crowd went, 
ape shit. And we were like looking at each other, you know, what the hell's going on? And back then we didn't have, you know, there wasn't like um, streaming services really uh, to, to, to sort of, to give you that instant feedback that you're getting lots of streams for a song. You know, it was just like, it was getting played on radio and because we were on tour, we never, we didn't really hear it on radio and stuff. You know, we were in vans or at gigs and stuff. And it was only that moment where we were like, Oh, something's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine that it must've by the sounds of things, cause you were in that bubble uh, and you were keeping going. You're so busy. It doesn't sound like you were, focused on like how things were being marketed or anything like that sounds like you were focused on making music playing gigs and uh and, and focusing on on the art and the work itself uh which is probably, you know that's ultimately what paid off because without the songs people are nothing uh so what happened when you know kill the director moving to new york uh let's dance to joy division all these records become huge hits how did your life change Um, I suppose massive. Well, we'd been doing so many gigs already, just they were a lot smaller, you know. So it was kind of over that next year and a half. Um, I mean, we did so many show like gigs in those years. It was like I can't remember what the record. I think it was something like two hundred and seventy in one of the years and two fifty in the other. You know, it was something mental, and we were just going around the world like going from doing clubs like we'd do a splitter van tour around the uk and europe and then we'd go and do like a van tour in america like you know not sleeping for driving mad distances all the rest of it and then some gigs in australia and then we'd come back and do the same thing again but that then the next time it would be on a tour bus um around the uk and europe and then go back to the us and that would be probably still just a van to be honest it took a bit longer in the states but you know we just kept going around the circuits and like the venues would just get bigger um and we did that two or three times in a row in in like uk europe and australia um and each time it just steadily got bigger and bigger um you know it really was like a whirlwind adventure and we were all just like what the hell's going on but again we didn't have much time to like stop and take a breath because it was just get through it and like keep doing gigs and keep partying. And like, you know, we just kept, I think also we had this feeling of like, uh, you know, this could end at any moment. Like what's going on? How, how are we suddenly in this situation? You know, it was just like, um, cause no one can teach you that at uni or any, you know, at school, it, you just have to deal with it as you go along. And yeah, it was, um, it was a fun, wild time. Wow. Yeah. And when, when you're when you were going around and around the world like this, playing all these shows, was there much time to actually see the places that you were going to? Yeah, well, that was the thing. We were a doing the gigs, but also being you know just tourists, like so excited to be in New York for the first time, or Sydney, or Paris, or, you know wherever. Um, well, we've been to Paris before, but you know, like in in various cities that we'd never been, and you'd just be like, whoa! So you'd get up like jet lagged or exhausted from the night before. But, you, you know, you, you're in this city for the first time and often you're only there for 24 hours. So, you'd got, you know, we'd go out and, like, walk around, see some of the, like, key sites or whatever, um, and then go and do some interviews, do a sound check, do some more interviews, have some food, do the gig, go out to some bars with whoever we'd meet um, or the label people or, you know, just whatever. Because um, you just wanted to experience everything you possibly could because again in the back of your mind you're like well maybe we won't get a chance to come back here again um but we did that for a while and honestly like you just end up so exhausted you know and we weren't we weren't warming up for the gigs properly we weren't warming down it was just like just chaos like lads in their young 20s just on tour and i ended up with like repetitive strain injury in my arms and um you know Murph would like nearly lose his voice before some gigs and it was all just like mad um <laughs> but, you know it was a learning experience and wouldn't have changed anything and and so was that you know when you had already started having hits and after you know a guide to love loss and desperation became huge uh were you 
kind of touring in what sounds like you know an amazing an amazing way uh, for young people but pretty like chaotic as well yeah yeah we we um we really did do it like sort of the old school way i guess where we started playing small bars and clubs you know from 2003 onwards and there'd be anywhere between like three and 50 people at gigs max you know and it was just like other bands friends and whatever like just normal stuff and then we got to the point i remember where we did this this gig in liverpool at the o2 academy what was the carling academy back then we did this like residency thing that i think our manager had set up um that was kind of our night and you know we started getting a couple of hundred people in and and that and then there was a young um like guy and girl who worked there who were at Lipper as well who did sound and lights and they were like oh one day you know if you guys we think you guys are going to do well here's our number like let us know if you ever need someone to come on the road with you and help out um, and I remember the first time we brought that you know we brought one of them on tour like the the guy doing the mixing and you have your own f- the first time you've got someone who's your mix engineer and then you, then the first time we had our own like a van you know, and it wasn't me driving or Murph driving. We actually had a van and every step of the way, it would just, you know, it was incremental. It would just get, someone would add to the crew. We'd get a slightly nicer van, slightly, you know, a tour manager and then so on and so on. And it would just keep building like that. Um, so it was really organic and like kind of slow in a way, but it was, it was great because we, and we used to lug all our, all our own gear around, set all our stuff up. You know, we were doing all that up until the album came out almost really. That's really cool. Um, do you think there are any ba- big bands out there now who came up in that way? Um, yeah, I'm sure there are. Um, I mean, I would think like most bands, you'd be surprised probably to learn that they all did that kind of, you know, I'm sure Coldplay did that. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. But again, they came up even before you guys. Because um, I, I wonder sometimes. Yeah, I rem- yeah they, were, they were good for years before. I wonder sometimes whether there's like um, is rock music still relevant anymore? Um, because like I remember when your first album came out, uh, it really was like in the same way that we already mentioned TikTok. In the same way that um, you know, I feel like young people really engage with hip hop um, and you know EDM as well. Um, back then, like rock music was still like a huge huge part of youth culture has it become more of a like a subculture and uh, now and more of a niche thing as opposed to like being a huge mainstream part of youth culture that it was back then um I, I, you'd probably know more about that than me to be honest like i mean i feel like i suppose what's getting played on radio and stuff maybe has changed a bit um but i, I listen to six music most of the time and um you know it's kind of you get a really interesting, like eclectic mix of stuff. And, you know, there's loads of, there's still loads of like indie artists out there, like doing kind of rock stuff. And I don't know, I feel like, yeah, it's not, it's not the same as it was um, when we, when we started, but then also like, you know, we're not exactly the same band as we were when we started, you know, our music's changed quite a bit over the years. And, um, you know, we like to mess with different sounds. And I think, you know, bands that do, sort of evolve and change with the times. Um, not not necessarily with the times, as in you're trying to reflect what's around you, but, you know, trying to push yourself and see what else is out there um, musically and creatively and stuff. I think there's always people who are interested in, in, in hearing that. And, you know, if you've got good songs and well-crafted, good lyrics, good melodies, it's like, I think that kind of still just will always stand the test of time. You know, people will... It will resonate with people, um, the radio execs and um, the TikTok influencers' hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that makes uh, absolute sense. And, and it's not to say as well, my question was not to say that there's not good music out there. Mm. Um, there is. There's probably more good music out there uh, than ever before because it's so much easier to to make it and release it so it's uh it's an amazing time but it's just interesting to see how uh culture 
has moved on a little bit and it's more yes i mean radio six is incredible though and and there's still big like fan bases for rock music but it's hmm. it's no longer it's, i think it's really cool as well that you, you know as you said before there's kind of some things that were kind of more sub genres or very underground kind of like styles of music with really hardcore fans there all of a sudden get that like in the limelight moments um and it's great you know and it propels artists up there and as you say we were playing moon to new york for years before it came out in a kind of very grassroots kind of underground um scene and then all of a sudden it popped its head up and had its little moments and you know so it, i think every every artist every band every genre has those kind of you know ebbs and flows and um people just like something new so i guess like as the next like five years after one thing the next generation are coming along and they're like they want something that's theirs that maybe isn't doesn't sound exactly the same as their older brothers or sisters or whatever so then they look for something else and then that gets propelled up you know it as you you know culture just does that doesn't it and it's like it's cool it's fun it's good um yeah absolutely uh, and that that's a very good way of phrasing it you know because a lot of people don't want to a lot of young people don't want to listen to the same thing as their older family members or you know a lot of people do but they want to have something yeah. that's theirs and that's part of their like generations um culture but yeah because it's, it's really cool like the, the amount of people we've met who um you know they're like oh my dad um introduced me to you guys you know or my older brother or whatever or you know and it's really nice that they as you say of course there are loads of people out there who who love what their parents um played them when they were younger and stuff um in my case neil young massive fan thanks dad <laughs> amazing uh, one of the, one of the best uh, um ever uh singer songwriter wise mm. um yeah I, I, I so many people are into what their parents listen to uh but I, that point is still very true that you want to have your own a lot of people want to have their own like um youth culture but uh, one thing that is for sure is that um despite it the chart scene or whatever changing very much since 2007 um you and and the wombats have released albums um that have done extremely well every single time um at, but it seems that you take a little while between each release you, you know you don't release something every year um like album wise you take a few years are you working on your albums consistently through that period or do you just give a, a bit of a break before starting to put new ideas together? Um, each album's been slightly different, but like, for example, this this album, I suppose was, was a bit unusual because of the pandemic and stuff, but we had, um, we had like half of it written before the pandemic. So that was 2019. Um, so our last album came out in 2018. Then we toured for most, like for about a year and a bit. And then we started, some writing sessions for the, you know, with an eye on the next album. Did that for like a year and then the pandemic hit. And then we did a bit, you know, carried on writing, doing some Zoom sessions and stuff and then recorded in the November. And we were, we were, so in a way, the album was kind of like finished recording wise by like January, about a year ago, basically. Um, so, but there's, there's like a seven month waiting list for vinyl pressing and stuff. So by the time we'd mixed and mastered it, you know, and we do take our time mixing and mastering and finessing all the details. Like it takes a while. Um, you know, sometimes we're working on like mix eight and nine of a song and, you know, it, it we do, cause we, we often have like a pretty solid idea of how we want it to sound. Um, and then, and it just takes time, you know, and we'd rather spend a little bit longer and have something that we are happy with. Um, than, than trying to rush an album out when there's no, you know, there's no need. And we've kind of had that ethos with every every album, really. Um, it's like, it's ready when it's ready. Um, and it's 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 normally because we tour so much, to be honest, that, that we end up with like, that's a year and a half already where we, we won't have done much writing, really. Maybe a little bit along the way, but, you know, we're not a band that write on tour. Some bands write in, you know, they'll be in the back lounge of the bus, like writing songs and stuff, but we're never really, we're not that kind of band. Um, we might do the odd jam here and there and a few little ideas, but 
we kind of like to like finish the tour and then we just start thinking and move ahead and try something different. Um, and so we did that. And then the album was supposed to come out in the summer, but because of COVID, we pushed it back um, to, to January, you know? So yes, there was, it was three and a half years, was it? Between albums, between these two. Um, yeah. But could have been three if we'd have really hammered it and there hadn't have been a pandemic, but um, yeah, there's, again, you know, I think also like if you rush too much music out, it's almost like too much for people to take. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. and like and all three of us do like side projects as well so it's kind of nice that we we get the time to work on some other music get some other ideas out of our heads and you know declutter the brain a little bit and then get together and fresh fresh canvas yeah absolutely how how did um writing and and recording and you know working on this remotely affect the sound of the record uh, which uh, i might add as well uh, for my listeners it's called fix yourself not the world um and it was released in january um and everybody should go and check it out uh now but uh you know so how, how did that, that you know basically having to make it during the pandemic how did that affect the sound do you think um <clears throat> well the, the the kind of i guess the main thing was that usually you're in the same studio with the same walls, you know, made of the same materials. So brick, wood, whatever in, in certain configuration with similar microphones through similar processes and the same desk. So you end up with like one, a room sound. And obviously, you know, the studio we were working in does have like a vocal booth and another little room that you can put amps in and stuff. And you can be as, you know, experimental as you want with using different mics and stuff but i think the fact that murph was in a different studio in la um with different instruments you know some different mic options different preamps and stuff like it probably made sonically like slightly gave hit the stuff that he was sending over like a tiny bit of a different sound that when slotted in in the session with us with what we were recording in that in that room I do think it's sonically a bit richer because of that. Um, so, you know, there's a bit more space between everything because they're in a different room. So it's like, I think you can feel, well, I, I can feel that. Um, and also just, we could, because there wasn't, when you're recording an album, there's a lot of time where like, you know, we've got one producer, maybe an engineer, and there's like, okay, Murph's going to go and play guitars now for like the next three or four hours. So I'll go and like either mess around with something on my laptop or mess around with some sounds on something else or do some backing vocals or sometimes just wait around and make lunch maybe, or, you know, and then it's, then you, then it's your, then you go and listen to what he's done and maybe have some comments or thoughts. And then maybe that carries on for a bit longer. And before you know it, you might've sat around for like five or six hours without really doing anything. So in this case, like we, we could pretty much 24 seven be recording, like, you know, I'd get in, do a load of drums. Murph could get in, do a load of guitars and Todd could be doing something else either in Oslo or when he was in London with me in the other room, you know, we, we could spend like longer on each part in a way because, um, we were in different rooms. <laughs> um, so I think that, that probably like slightly changed how the workflow um, was. It was bad in a way though, cause the, for the producer like for, and and the engineer over in LA they had to be so organized with like keeping all the files in the right places and you know just pragmatically like having everything labeled correctly and making sure everything was like yeah in the right part of the song and you know there was lots of that where we were like hang on a minute I'm sure that's not supposed to be there you know you just had to keep your ears open all the time um yeah but we had we had like the demos that we'd done before like we're always really hands on with the production of everything and um again, because we learned so much like from being in Lipper and doing our own recordings and stuff. Um, so we, you know, we're not like a band that kind of just don't have a clue what's going on in the recording process. Like we're very much hands-on and have, yeah, co-produce everything pretty much. Um, so like for us as well, we had the the demos like ready to go and with with lots of like notes of like okay this bit should be probably a bit faster or maybe a bit heavier or slight tweak of this fill or whatever 
you know, that we had loads of notes about every song we were going to do. And we'd all kind of signed off on what we were trying to achieve with every song before we went in the studio. So we were quite organized and, you know, we approached it in a very, we knew we needed to be a bit more organized because we weren't in the same room. That's, that's interesting. And it, it must have been, were you planning on doing something so fresh? Was it, was it literally just the pandemic that, that caused you to change your process? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was just a pandemic. I mean, we've, we've done, we have recorded, um, we've made songs remotely and like sent ideas back and forth um, because of, you know, geographically we haven't been in the same place, but this is the first time we've ever done an actual album um, in, in a different place. And and it was literally because Murph couldn't fly over from LA, you know, he just couldn't fly. Um, and if he, if he did fly, he would have had to quarantine for two weeks, both sides. And we were just like, that's just ridiculous. Like he's got a little kid and stuff and, you know, he would have been away for like three months or something if he had done that. Yeah. Um, so we were like, we, we just we just knew we could make it work. And the producer, you know, Mark Crew, who produced the album with us, um, he we've worked with him on the last two albums and he just put our minds at ease as well. He was like, yeah, well, you know, we'll just, we'll just make it work. Don't worry about it. And why did you decide to call the album uh, Fix Yourself, Not The World? Well... I guess it was probably slightly influenced by the pandemic. Um, you know, everyone went on a bit of a journey, didn't they? Inwards, there were less distractions out there. So it was kind of, let's, um, you know, confront those demons or those issues that maybe we've managed to escape for the last however many years. Um, and so there was definitely a journey and a, like a growth and a letting go and acceptance. Like, I think we all went on various journeys. And I remember when, um, you know, lyrically as well in some of the songs, it's kind of, um, that it deals with key, you know, that like transitions in life and like ready for the high, for example, you know, just accepting that you're going into a new phase and things are changing, but that's cut. That's, you know, just accept it and get through it. And I think with the, um, with the pandemic, like towards the end of that, of the album process, um, Murph sent over like, uh, here's what I was thinking for the album title, Fix Yourself, Not The World. And we had this like big, long um, email thread that we just kept going back and forth on. And it provoked such a conversation between the three of us. Because um, obviously there are two ways, well, there are multiple ways of of, um, of interpreting the title um, from, uh, you know, that feels pretty selfish in a time when, you know, with climate change and existential things happening that, are so much bigger than just your own brain. Like, you know, we don't want people to think that that's what we're saying. And we were like, well, no, but that's not, that's not what, that's not what we're saying. Um, and we were like, yeah, but how do we get that across? Cause obviously the, the, the point of the title is if you're not in a good place mentally, then you, you're not going to be much use to anyone else. You know, you're not going to be able to like be there for your partner or your friends or your family. You know, you're going to, you're going to be stuck in your own head and fighting against whatever's going on in there. Um, and, you know, mental health's always been a, a topic that Murph's especially like talked about in songs and stuff um, quite openly. Um, and, and so I guess this album was like accepting that you can't fix everyone else's problems. You know, you can't solve everything, maybe just start with yourself. And then once you get to a point of, um, serenity and zen then you can go out and help as many people as you can and try and make a difference in the world and stuff but um, just to not neglect yourself because um, all those issues are still going to be there waiting for you when you you know when you come back from that meal or from the cinema or from a bender or whatever <laughs> um, whatever you do to try and forget about it so yeah um, makes complete sense yeah and then which is also why we, we felt like calling the last song on the album, um, which was just a jam we'd done in, in uh, a little studio by Murph's house uh, pre-pandemic. Um, after a little smoke, we were just, we had a little jam and we were, we were going to, we were thinking we should try and finish that, you know, finish the song at some point, but little by little, we were like, oh, actually, let's just not touch it. It's just really nice. Like a little calm end to the album and, 
And especially if, if we call it Fix Yourself, Then the World, hopefully it, it gives the listener an idea that, you know, start with yourself. And then hopefully by the time you get to the end of the album, you're ready to go out there and like... How, how does it feel to have the album top the charts in the UK? And, and, and was this released independently? Yeah, so the, the last two albums we've, we we did with um with AWOL, sorry, oh. um with AWOL. Um, I think I'm still jet lagged from America. Um, yeah, the and um, they've been great. Like we, you know, we we fund the album ourselves and then license it to them. Um, and it's just it works so much better um, for us. And um, yeah, it was a great moment. Like you know especially after the last couple of years to, to finally get that kind of number one. Um, I mean, it's an arbitrary figure at the same time, you know, I think we've all got that um, sort of grounded reality in our heads where another week, you know, if someone, someone else could have sold more, it's just, we were lucky with the timing and, um, and also just how many of our fans came out to see us play in, in the week leading up to the album and bought the album, you know, we've got such a great fan base and they're so supportive and, um, yeah, it felt like it was a pretty big moment. You know, the amount of messages we were getting from friends and family and stuff, just being like, what the fuck? Number one. Like, you know, it, it it's just a nice milestone, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, really incredible, especially uh, after, you know, you, you haven't got number one, but I mean, you've got so many successful albums, you know, platinum and gold and silver um, albums. All your albums have done really well and had a lot of thought put into them um and and so yeah i mean you know congrats on 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 the number one album and on making oh, it fantastic sounding album. thank you so much for coming on the podcast and where will you be on tour uh if people listening want to come and see the live show um so we're, we're off to Lollapalooza in chile argentina and brazil uh next week and then after that we've got a uk tour um and then a european tour playing most countries um and then australia in june and then some festivals this summer um and that's about as much as my brain can think about at the moment <laughs> yeah, that's going to be uh amazing and probably very tiring and hectic but uh yeah i, oh, I love it can't oh. wait after the last two years of no gigs honestly this is just it's all just so good to be back and being in a room with people smiling and singing and having a good time it's it's why we started a band in the first place.